All right, so uh, it's uh, convenient to give this talk after Katie's because she mentioned that she was sort of looking forward to where DRA would be in about a year. Uh, well, hopefully after this talk, you can see a lot of things that might come online very soon that uh, maybe are a surprising amount of functionality. Okay, so the, the general theme will be, uh, for lack of a better term, what I would call direct linear algebra and optimization. Really what I mean by this is dense linear algebra, sparse direct linear algebra, like you know, sparse Cholesky, sparse least squares, uh, along with interior point methods for dense and sparse matrices. So I'll be talking about sort of what the data structures are and what sort of functionality has come online uh, that hopefully will be under DRA very quickly. Okay, so as some background, the, the library that I've been developing uh, actually basically since right as I started my PhD uh, is called Elemental. It's a, a C++ and MPI library uh, that back then C++11 didn't exist, but it's you know, since been transitioned in a nice way. And uh, the initial goals of the project were effectively just to support you know, dense blahs, dense Cholesky, dense LU, and so there was a, a class that was created for this uh, called the dist matrix class, which you know, ever since then has really been the heart of this library, at least in the context of dense and sparse direct linear algebra. And so uh, this object I can talk about a bit more later, but it contains a very large number of different data distributions, which behind the scenes uh, can easily be moved between with just an operator equal and C++. And typically that looks like some MPI collective going on behind the scenes. Um, so in about 2009, that was where the, the project was. Uh, about 2010, I spent a summer at Argonne National Lab and uh, added on uh, eigensolver functionality and actually spent a huge amount of time just benchmarking on you know, 8,000 or so cores of blue gene P and uh, ended up uh, pushing out a, a Tom's publication with a lot of that data. Um, and interestingly enough, one of the actual first users of the library was you know, Julia's own Miles Lubin, who uh, saw that there was a, a nice distributed dense uh, LDL factorization, and he ended up using it for a really impressive stochastic optimization problem that uh, I think he got several nice publications out of. Um, so that was about 2010. Uh, 2011, uh, I started you know, filling out more functionality, uh, added a sparse direct solver, um, at least for, you know, sparse Cholesky. And then about 2012, um, you know, the SVD was finally there for dense distributed SVD. And I ended up defending a, a dissertation which heavily used this library. Uh, in particular, I embedded the uh, elemental under a new sparse direct solver, which then was part of a, a preconditioner for time harmonic uh, Helmholtz equations. Um, so it was nice that, you know, it ended up actually becoming useful for my research. Um, 2013, it started filling out a bit more, so I moved from the University of Texas to Stanford. Um, at that point, the library started picking up a little bit of an optimization flavor. If you're at Stanford, you can't help it. <laughs> I took uh, one class from, you know, sat in on a class taught by Emmanuel Candez, another from Stephen Boyd. Before you know it, you can't help but just start implementing some optimization routines. Oh, uh, if people can't hear. Can anybody not hear? I can speak up. Oh, okay. Sure. Okay, is that a little better? Okay, so uh, I guess the, the sort of one sentence overview then, since none of that was recorded apparently, uh, is that up to about 2012, uh, it was effectively a dense linear algebra library that had a little bit of sparse direct support. Um, and then about 2013, I caught the bug, if you will, of convex optimization and started uh, toying around with some ADMM and added uh, a routine that would do uh, low rank plus sparse decompositions on very big machines. So I did a few experiments and could do, say, low rank plus sparse decompositions of I think 80,000 by 80,000 dense matrices uh, with maybe ranks of about an order of 100 in, in a few minutes. Um, and then around uh, that time, I was filling out more sparse direct functionality um, and realized, well, why don't I just go ahead and start working on interior point methods? Um, but then there was a year in the middle where I moved to Georgia Tech and actually kind of took a detour and added a lot of support for computing pseudospectra. So, I'll talk you know, very briefly about that as well, but uh, there's some interesting functionality in the library if you want to compute 
uh, how sensitive uh, to perturbations the eigenvalues of are your non-symmetric matrix. And maybe you have a you know, 100,000 by 100,000 matrix and a few thousand cores to throw at it. This is what this is for. Um, OK, so 2015 is where the really interesting things started happening, I think. Uh, the great uh, big leap in functionality was in recognizing that quasi-semi-definite matrices are really important and very useful. Uh, so for those of you that aren't in the optimization community, it's something that I think should be used much more in the numerical linear algebra community. It's effectively a nice uh, recognition that a Cholesky-like factorization can be used for much more than Cholesky. Um, I have some slides at the end that I might you know, uh, briefly discuss for those that are interested, but uh, this isn't a numerical analysis talk, but more or less if you have a sparse direct Cholesky, very quickly you can have sparse uh, non-symmetric sparse least squares, uh, Tikhonov, all these sorts of things without much more work. Um, and so once I, I realized that, uh, I started supporting, um, I wrote a, a distributed uh, linear program solver for dense and sparse matrices, extended that to quadratic programs, and then as of last week, extended that to uh, distributed sparse uh, second order cone programs. And thankfully, as of yesterday, all the tests from CVXPy pass. <laughs> so it's actually a, a reasonably uh, robust solver. OK, so that would be the wordy way to put it. If, you, you know, if that's a little bit of text overkill in equations, the sort of history of the, the support of the library looks uh, something like this. In 2009, there was you know, dense blahs, uh, dense factorizations. Then eigensolvers came along in 2010. A little more uh, sparse linear algebra, SVD, more sophisticated applications, matrix functions, uh, pseudospectra, and an interface to scaly pack and then you know, an explosion of functionality in about the last year. Um, OK, so in terms of how this all connects to Julia, historically, one of the biggest problems I've had with the library is that there are a large number of data distributions, and <laughs> it tends to be a brick wall for people uh, to have to read the manual, look up how is it distributed. You know, do I need to write my own custom routine to do a redistribution to interface with you? Uh, this is something that tends to require a collaboration and often even a one-on-one -on -one collaboration. Um, and so that really killed the, you know, the uptake of this library for some time. But I was happy because I was using it for my projects, and so I didn't really care all that much. Um, uh, so you know, to, I guess, summarize the data distributions, and I'll talk about in a minute how that problem recently went away. Um, as I said, originally, there was this disk matrix class that was for just dense distributed matrices, which already had 13 different data distributions. Really, the user would only have to interact with one of them. And for those of you that are familiar with ScalyPack, it was just a special case. Um, but the show of hands, how many of you have ever manually called ScalyPack? Wow. OK, so that's about five people. Could anybody summarize how long it might have taken to write a custom routine to do that? Yeah, like to actually hook it into your application. OK, yeah, and, so, and you're <laughs> basically a professional developer. So in practice, <laughs> for <laughs> Yeah, so uh, I mean, I, I have a lot of respect for a lot of the work in Scaly Pack, so I, I won't, I guess uh, maybe when I was uh, first starting this project, my opinion was a little lower. but. Uh, I will say that the, the support for distributed sure decompositions is something that has never been implemented anywhere else. And actually, for my pseudo-spectra work, that was an integral component. But yes, uh, to be perfectly honest, I did run into a number of bugs, and uh, I kind of just work around them. But yeah, it, it tends to be a, a barrier. But for those of you familiar with ScalyPack, the distribution that I you know, use for the dense linear algebra is just a special case of that, where you have block sizes of one. So if you've interfaced to ScalyPack, it's a trivial change if you wanted to directly hook in. Um, but then, you know, uh, uh, so I guess that's what I was just talking about. So I added an interface to ScalyPack, which I'd call the block disk matrix class, and then hooked it up so that you can just do operator equal when you move between the two data distributions. So once you've interfaced with my library, you also then have an interface to ScalyPack that's trivial. Um, and so I use this internally in, uh, for computing pseudospectra. I'll do my own reduction to Hessenberg form convert to block form for scaly pack, call their Hessenberg QR algorithm, convert back, and then compute pseudospectra in my distribution. Um, and then for sparse matrices, there's yet another one. Uh, for how many people have uh, built a matrix in Petsy? 
Okay, a few more than Scaly Pack. Uh, I actually expected a lot more than that. Uh, so it's uh, effectively just a one-dimensional distribution. It's about as simple as a way as you could distribute a sparse matrix. You just give a chunk of rows to each process. Um, and this is nice because you, you know, for a lot of PDEs, like say one-dimensional Laplace, two-dimensional Laplace, you expect some sort of bandedness. And so if you, you don't really want to do a fine grain wrapping because if you uh, give processes contiguous chunks of rows, you tend to have locality in the communication that takes place. So maybe one process only needs to talk to one or two other processes. Um, so the distribution of that, of a sparse matrix often tends to be very different than of a dense matrix for that reason. Um, and then uh, you need to have some way, a, a vector that's effectively compatible. So the same way that you distribute the sparse matrix where each process gets a chunk of rows, you give a chunk of row indices to, uh, of a vector to a single process. And so this is sort of the family of distributions that exists, and it was kind of a pain to try and describe these to people <laughs> uh, because I ideally your application could hook into any of these as appropriate. Um, so sort of the, the blessing and the curse uh, was that I started just adding more functionality and kind of ignored this problem. Uh, and so what happened is that when I started building on top of interior point methods to support things like basis pursuit and uh, elastic nets and lasso, um, I had to do a very large amount of custom uh, matrix packing. Uh, so how many of you have uh, filled manually uh, a matrix to call an interior point method for one of these problems? Okay, that's a very low number of people. <laughs> well, it's, it's gross, right? It's famously gross. And in fact, it's so annoying that people build entire packages just to avoid that. Now this is distributed, <laughs> so it's, it, it tends to be uh, about an order of magnitude worse. And so I wrote custom code for maybe about 100 different cases to, to do this distributed matrix packing uh, to call various interior point methods. And what you notice is that there's a common pattern that emerges. And so then you, know, go, you go and I, I think I actually deleted about you know, several thousand lines of code once I wrote a nicer interface. And now that one interface is effectively how I'd tell everyone to use the library and how I'll uh, interface with DRA very soon. Um, okay, so as I said, hundred, literally hundreds of times I wrote this and I took a cue from Petsy. Uh, so one of the nice uh, ways that Petsy uh, cues or you know, constructs a distributed sparse matrix is that you just say, okay, I'm gonna start assembly. I have some local non-zeros. Uh, I tell the library, you know, what are the ij indices of where the non-zero will go? What's the value you want to do an update with? And then at the end, you just say process. And it does some sort of all-to-all -all communication, sends the data where it needs to go, and then does uh, just local updates after this one collective communication routine. Uh, so that interface is now what I support for every data structure in the library. So you don't have to know how it's distributed if you have this sort of interface. All you need to know is which entries do I have and you just tell the library where you, you know, that you want to apply them, and it, it does the necessary communication pretty efficiently to, to construct the object. Um, okay, so um, the, there are effectively three routines that are needed for this. The first one would be optional. Uh, you, know, you wouldn't have to do it if you don't care about constant reallocations, but if you're going to queue up some list of things that you're going to communicate, it's nice to give an upper bound before you start so that the memory can be preallocated. Uh, so this reserve function serves that purpose. You, you tell you know, your distributed sparse or dense matrix that uh, locally I'm going to queue up, say, 10,000 remote updates. So you say reserve 10,000. And then you loop over your 10,000 entry updates, and you call queue update. So if you're going to update the ij entry with value, you call queue update ij value. And at the very end, you say process queues, and it does one all-to-all -all communication and applies all of the updates. Um, so this is much nicer than, say, manually <laughs> looking up the details of a block matrix distribution or et cetera and you know, coding your own MPI all to all, which for those of you that haven't been just thoroughly beaten down by that process, it, it can take quite a long time to, to really wrap your head around uh, coding MPI all to all. Um, I know it did for me when the first time I had to do it. So with this, you don't have to at all. Um, so uh, elemental.jl is something that is extremely experimental right now. I basically got it working again at about, oh, I don't know, 6 a.m. this morning. <laughs> uh, so I've been busy uh, 
You know, the last time I tried to build it was before there was any interior, or there was a little bit of interior point method support, but it wasn't anything to uh, write home about. Um, and so recently I, I got this going again, and now that single uh, interface is supported for all of the data structures. Um, and pretty soon you won't even have to think at all, you can just you know, pass in a D array and it'll do this conversion for you. Um, okay, so again, this is trivial assuming one thing. All you have to know for this interface to be easy is which global indices do I locally own? This will take a few lines of code, but hopefully it'll you know, uh, clean up the, uh, the API for, for D array a bit after this is going. <laughs> Okay, uh, so I'll start with, you know, this is a Python example of what that process would look like. I'll show a Julia example on the next slide. It's basically the same. Uh, so if you wanted to construct, say, a 2D finite difference matrix with this interface, you say A is some distributed sparse matrix, you tell it, you compute the height and width. If I had an N0 by N1 grid, you'd have N0 by N1 indices in the rows and columns. Um, you resize the matrix to that and then you know, you could say, well, how many row indices were assigned to me? This isn't required, but it was the easiest way to, to give an example. Um, you reserve, say, six non-zeros for each row that's assigned to you. You loop over the, the, the row indices uh, that you own. So, I mean, I, it, it turns out the way this is constructed allows you not to communicate at all, but uh, you could ignore maybe this section of the code if it seems too complicated. All that really matters is that if you want to apply, say, an update to the diagonal, so the S, the diagonal entry, you want to add 11 to it, then if you want the update to possibly uh, involve some communication, then you just tell it this is not a passive update. So another thing you could have done is said, well, only update it if I happen to own it locally. That way you could take a sequential program to load this matrix and it would be functioning. Uh, the only process that owned a particular entry would actually do anything in that call, but if you want it to actually uh, do a remote update, then you just tell it this is not a passive update to the distributed matrix. Um, so this is you know, a very simple example of what it looks like to build a, a 2D finite difference matrix with some arbitrary set of coefficients. I picked this just to make it ill-conditioned. Um, okay, and so then you construct this distributed sparse matrix, construct some random right-hand side, uh, and, you know, I could build that with the same interface should I have actual data. And then I actually do a, a least absolute value regression solve there uh, in using a distributed uh, uh, quadratic program. Or actually, sorry, a distributed linear program. Uh, so for those of you who are not familiar with least absolute value regression, it's just the one norm equivalent of least squares. So you want to minimize the one norm of AX minus B, um, which takes a little bit more work. Okay, so in Julia, it looks basically the same. Uh, you can execute this right now. In fact, it's one of the, the two example drivers. And I apologize for that, those arrows showing up at the bottom. Um, so I, I think this is a fairly simple API, but I made it look a little more complicated than normal because I'm actually looping already over the indices that were assigned to particular processes. But just think of, you can do arbitrary updates with QUpdate. Whatever entry you want to update with it, you can. All that matters is that at the end, when you're done queuing updates, you call process queues. And this is what actually does all of the MPI communication and does the local updates. Um, OK. So that's an example of uh, what you could do now. Um, there's actually already a second order cone solver that you could call with an arbitrary uh, problem. You could do the same thing with an LP or QP. Um, it would be you know, actually a few minutes of work to add support for, say, lasso, elastic nets, um, uh, a variety of different, like basis pursuit, basis pursuit, well, basis pursuit denosing is lasso, but um, a, a large amount of uh, functionality. Um, so I'm probably finishing really early, which I don't mind at all, uh, but there's a huge list of people that have been uh, absolutely integral to this. I, I didn't throw all their names in into the middle of the talk because it would have really cluttered things. Uh, but sort of in reverse chronological order, uh, the person who's been helpful the most recently is Stephen Diamond, who's a, a new PhD student of Stephen Boyd. So as of about two days ago or 24 hours ago, the second order cone solver is hooked under CVX Pi and pass all of the, the entire test suite. Uh, Jaime Vron is uh, uh, a researcher at IBM Research, who's been using this pretty heavily for a backend uh, for one of their projects. 
uh, and then uh, several Julia developers, Ji Hao, Jake, and Andreas are the ones that actually wrote the very first version of uh, Elemental.jl, or wrote most of it, rather. Saying they wrote the first version is a bit misleading. Um, and then uh, Michael Saunders was really integral for starting to add support for all of these quasi-semi-definite solvers. Um, so it's part of the reason that there's such an explosion of functionality. And then uh, a long list of people that it would be rude not to include their names for. Uh, then, of course, I'd uh, like to thank the, the funding agencies that have supported this, DARPA, NSF, uh, KAUST, and then the, the various universities that have bounced around the past few years. Uh, so two years ago, I was at Austin, <laughs> and then I've bounced uh, to, to Georgia Tech and Stanford. Um, so if anybody has any questions, there should be plenty of time. Um, uh, so I guess with that, um, future, oh, I forgot future work. Here we go. Uh, so as I promised, uh, something that I had hoped would be functioning today, but there was a little bit of a, a problem with Julia's shared library loading yesterday that cost me a few hours. Um, but there should be transparent support for DRay for this functionality very, very soon. Um, and it, all it requires is, as I said, looping over the local indices of, of, um, assigned to each worker. Um, I'd hope to have a full interface to the entire library. It, it's been supported in C and Python for a while, but um, I need to have it in Julia. And in fact, the wrapper code for Julia is much cleaner, so there's really no excuse. Um, and then in terms of non-Julia functionality, the, the biggest thing on my list now is to add support for distributed, sparse, and dense uh, semi-definite programs. Um, I, I should have put this on the list, but I'd really love to have a Blas library that supported higher precision than double. So if I hit some barrier in my interior point method, no pun intended, where I can't get more than, say, eight digits, it would be really nice to fall back to higher precision if the user was okay with that, so to maybe get 12 digits of accuracy. But unfortunately, there aren't any good high performance, say, double-double or quad blas libraries right now. Um, I'll be adding accelerator support pretty soon as well. Um, one of the more important things for working with high edge degree uh, problems is to have not just one-dimensional sparse matrix distributions, which tend to be fine for PDEs that have low edge degrees, but they're not okay for networks. Um, and then a, a rewrite of the Petsy interface and a ridiculous amount of more documentation is needed. Um, so in terms of availability, all of this is under a new BSD license, which I'm uh, very protective of not introducing GPL components. Um, and you can find the, the website here, the GitHub, and then the elemental.jl uh, website is at the bottom. Thanks. <laughs> so if anybody has any you know, questions or even better criticisms, I'd be happy to hear them. That's a really long discussion that gets very heated very fast. Uh, my feeling is that the machines we currently have will still be just as good. Personally, I'm happy computing on 1,000 nodes, 100 oh, nodes, 10 nodes, 20 nodes. Uh, if I was really you know, doing a giant climate simulation, that's one thing. But I think you know, there's a, a big realm of parallel computing that's kind of in the blind spot right now especially in the academic computing community, which is something more than one node and less than a million cores. <laughs> so <laughs> I very much like to live in the world that's more than one node and less than a million. Uh, and uh, in that realm, I think, you know, at least for, you know, uh, let's say 100 GPUs or something like this, it's not quite so important to have fault tolerance. Uh, not that I would be against it, and in fact, I. I would love to support something other than MPI. In an earlier version of this library, I actually did rip out MPI. Uh, so the, the predecessor to the uh, mic uh, was the uh, maybe unfortunately named single chip cloud computer, uh, actually uh, did rip out MPI and use the custom communication uh, library for Elemental. And it wasn't a ton of work. Um, this was done by a, a PhD student, uh, Brian Marker. And so I'm very confident that should there actually be a competitor to MPI, it wouldn't be a ton of work to, um, to replace the one file where I actually call MPI functions directly. 
Any other questions? Did you um, look at global arrays at all as an alternative to MPI? So I'm not a, yes. I mean, it, it could be done. I, I'm not necessarily a huge fan of the, the shared uh, address space model, but uh, it's something that could be done. I, I haven't been necessarily convinced by the benchmarks. And uh, if PGAS started supporting a lot more fault tolerance, maybe it does and I'm not aware, uh, that would be interesting. But uh, you know, I, I have a close collaborator, you, you know Jeff very well, that is very active in that community. Uh, but uh, that's, that's kind of why I asked. Yeah. Also because you're talking about DRA support and they're kind of closed. Yeah, so the, the thing is though that the library itself would, has a lot of benefit of not uh, adopting that shared address space model. So for DRA, the idea is that it would be transformed into a model where data is explicitly managed, which already happens within the library. Once I'm done computing, I put it back. So for something like an interior point method, that redistribution is completely trivial. It's like one hundredth of the communication that would take place in each iteration. Um, so I, I think that overhead, especially for heavy duty machinery, is um, completely negligible. Uh, any other questions? Okay, well, thanks. Thank you.